In 2021, I was on my way to Ciderfest when I got two texts from my mom. The first one was a generic hope you have fun message right when I left. The second one came an hour later when she sent me a message that just said, I took a quiz and it says I'm most like Twilight Velvet. This killed me, partly because I know she has no idea who that is, and partly because I'm 80% sure she was trying to bond with me and just googled MLP parents quiz. Parents are weird. Almost everyone's got them, or at the very least has had their genetic material pulled from two other humans somewhere, but they're also not just older versions of you. My favorite thing about episodes that feature the parents of main characters is that even when a show brings in mom, dad, mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, or aunt and cooler aunt, I still have absolutely no idea where the episode is going. This is such an absurdly large topic that I had to cut it off at some point, but I went down some really encouraging rabbit holes. There's some degree of truth to the idea that we all eventually become our parents. That kind of statement should come with a dozen asterisks, but a lot of kids instinctively or not just absorb a lot of the personality and mannerisms of the people that raised them. The most charming part of getting to learn about Twilight's upbringing is seeing just how much she takes after her mom and dad. Even before we know their names, Nightlight and Twilight Velvet are the kind of archetypical supportive parents you'd expect from an over achieving A student. She even takes part of her name from her mother, a pony naming convention that, while not explicitly stated in any media I've consumed so far, is generally a pretty good indicator that two characters share some DNA. They have such a healthy family dynamic that the one episode Twilight spends bonding with her parents had to introduce conflict by bringing back one of the most toxically assertive characters in the series just to give her something to fight against. Fluttershy is in the same boat, and while we don't see nearly as much of Mr. and Mrs. Shy as we do Twy's parents, they both have spot-on recreation of Fluttershy's kind and timid softness. Their whole house oozes warm comfort, like they live in a cup of hot chocolate. Some people make it a point to be nothing like their parents. These black sheep are usually played for comedic effect, and while it's still fun, I'm a little more wary when a show tries this. With Pinky, at least I know what they were going for. We have an energetic, fun-loving character who flies by the seat of her plot, and the intended payoff of this in the Cutie Mark Chronicles is that her parents are a dry, conservative patchwork of Amish lifestyles and mannerisms. This is funny, but once you know the writing team never intended to explore her parents as characters in the first 65 episodes, it really feels like they wrote themselves into a corner. They managed to squeak an okay episode about family traditions out of it, but if the writers knew they were going to be eight more seasons of Horse, I don't think they would have written them as such limiting archetypes. But I'm not nearly as baffled by them as I am with Rarity's parents. Hondo Flanks and Cookie Crumbles appear with almost no fanfare at the top of Sisterhood Social, and I at least understand what they were going for. Rarity loves high fashion and speaks with a posh transatlantic accent, so it's funny when her parents are down-to-earth schlubs that talk like they're from northern Minnesota. I get that, but they first appear in the background of a tracking shot, obscured by on-screen credits, and then aside from the occasional background appearance, you don't ever see them again. It's like the show set out just to prove their existence and then wiped them from the face of the earth. Even Jim Miller had to hand-wave them away on Twitter by claiming they were out of town during Crusaders of the Lost Mark. I don't know, it just feels like I'm being gaslit. When it comes to relating pony stuff to my real-life parents, I'm lucky enough to have a special skill called being 32 and having my own place. I never hid my interests from them, but I also never shared unless they asked. Then I got my first tickets to Ciderfest, and I told them all about the convention and how Yona, Cozy, and Terramar were gonna be there. Mom was excited for me, even if she kept confusing MLP with Rainbow Bright, the Mattel toy that premiered the same year as Rescue at Midnight Castle. My dad wasn't thinking, though, and put his foot right in his mouth by asking, why would anyone want to go to something as stupid as that. I think he could tell he'd really stepped in it based on how fast I changed the subject, but it still hurt a little. I like parental conflict in media because it's usually pretty nuanced and it comes in a thousand different flavors. Unfortunately for most kids shows, half of those flavors get locked away because they're nowhere near appropriate for a kid show audience. So it was a long time before I started seeing episodes that dealt with complex emotional scenarios, let alone when it came to parents. So imagine my surprise when the show smacks me in the face with Team Dash in Season 7. I'll go to bat for this episode. Bo Hothoof and Windy Whistles being smothering, hyper-proud parents is simultaneously a breath of fresh air and exactly what I was expecting. This is one of those rare episodes without an obvious solution, and while the knee-jerk reaction seems to be that Dash was in the wrong, I'll point out that we don't really know anything about Dash's relationship with her parents. All we can do is sit in the same boat as Scoots and throw out vague eye statements like, if those were my parents, I would love them unconditionally. We can never truly have a grip on our friend's relationship with their parents, and that's both the coolest and scariest thing about raising children. Seasons 7 and 8 really stepped up to the plate when it came to stories about 
smothering parents. I was way too hard on the parent map when I ranked every episode last year. It could have done a story about the homebody dad or the helicopter mother, but the show chose to tackle both simultaneously. These aren't awful, mean parents, they just want what's best for their kid, and I like that they course corrected in wildly opposite directions. Parents are just kids having kids, and they're not infallible. There's no rulebook for what they're doing. Even if you don't meet someone's folks, you can still feel their influences. I really like the detail in Top Bolt, after all the showboating and hurt feelings with Sky Stinger and Vapor Trail, where we get this little psychological profile of the students, and see them seek or shy away from attention based on the kind of family they had growing up. They didn't have to do that, but I really enjoyed that little bonus. Bonus scene. This is an example of the second kind of conflict, where the problem is less about the parents and more about what they left behind. Grandpere did a horrible thing to his daughter, and it's a guilt that haunts him all the way up until we meet him at the top of the perfect pair. Similarly, we don't even meet Spike's father, and Spike spends more than a couple episodes coming to grips with what that absence means for him as a person. Then you have the outright bad parents, the ones you want to launch to the moon. Diamond Tiara has a whole song about the toxic perfectionism thrust on her by her parents, particularly her mother, Spoiled Rich. It sucks, and it's tough to watch, but at least we got satisfying character growth out of it, which is more than I can say for Scootaloo's parents. Snap Shutter and Maine Allgood are the worst kinds of parents from a media criticism standpoint, because they're not even faulty in an interesting way that can be picked apart. They're more like afterthoughts that showed up a decade later and tried to pretend that they haven't been missing the entire show. It's much more fun when parenthood happens to establish characters we already know. There's something mind-blowing about looking at people you know and coming to the startling realization that that guy's a dad. Shining Armor and Cadence are one of my favorite couples in the series, because you see them as a married couple long before they have a kid. You don't get a lot of their parenting style in the show, but you know they love Flurry Heart more than anything in the universe, and it's really wholesome. They also portray the tired parents cliche better than almost any couple in fiction, and I don't take that lightly. Especially when your kid was born with at least three superpowers. And while we barely knew Mr. and Mrs. Cake before they had twins, the fact that they could take care of two kids and part of a pinky shows that they're more than competent parents, despite the comically shifty eyes from Dad in the nursery. Pinky and Big Mac are also all but confirmed to have one child each in the final episode of the show, which is fun because I couldn't think of two characters who better telegraph the kind of parents they'd be. Big Mac is probably that tough but fair father figure who keeps their kids in line, while Pinky is the cool fun mom when you stay over at a friend's house who has never said we have McDonald's at home in her entire life. And I won't finish this section without at least mentioning Hitch Trailblazer and the weird adoptive relationship he has with Sparky and Make Your Mark tell your tale and all the other media around Generation 5. He's a good dad, for sure, loving and attentive while doing a pretty good job hiding the fact that at the start of their relationship, he really had no idea what he was doing. I've seen a fair amount of criticism that adding Sparky as a surrogate child flattened Hitch as a character down to just Dragon Dad, which is fair because he wasn't tremendously dynamic to begin with, but it's still better than him being reduced to just cop. A couple weeks after my parents found out I was a Pony fan, Mom took us to a flea market. She loves them, but it's important to not get your hopes up for anything specific. Sometimes you get some interesting niche stuff, like this officially licensed Twilight and Starlight DVD compilation from 2017. I almost bought it, but it's literally just a Starlight Glimmer variety pack of five episodes from the series, unless you're interested in the sing-along mode that comes bundled in. Ten minutes later, I could tell my dad had found the same DVD, because I could hear him over-enthusiastically shout across the room, Wow, John, I can't believe you didn't pick up this My Little Pony DVD. It was cringy when it happened, but I know he was just trying to make up for putting his foot in his mouth, and I appreciate the effort. Later series episodes would really start stretching the definition of parents, most notably with the mentors that drop off the young six in the season eight premiere. Some of them we'd seen before, like Thorax, Ember, Grandpa Gruff, and Prince Rutherford. These are less biological guardians and more like village elders, support structures back home, and representatives of the student species, Yak, Griffin, Changeling, etc. This kind of leader mentor role extends outside this episode. I don't have a lot to say about them, but you can't forget standouts like Queen Novo, Chief Thunderhooves, or Big Boss Daddy Dragonlord Torch. Even Gen 5 is holding it down for single parents, either explicitly in the case of Alphabetal, or more implied, as is the case with his main squeeze, Queen Haven. And Chrysalis... Okay, look, I'm gonna put a stopper on Chrysalis for a moment until I have time to dedicate a video breaking her down sometime later. She's a ruthless, vindictive leader for her hive, but when it comes to the biology of it all, I just didn't have time to write a section for her without reading or watching a bunch of supplemental material. I did have one horrifying moment during research where I thought that she might have given birth to her entire hive, but I brought it up to my buddy Quantum Hippologist, who said something about them coming from trees. I trust him as much as myself when it comes to obscure knowledge about supplemental material, but 
which you should bug him about it if you're curious. But you can also stretch the definition of parenting in less weird, non-bug-related ways. Sonny's dad is revealed to be dead seven minutes into a new generation. That's a bold, bold decision to make in the first ten minutes of your reboot. But thankfully they treat it with exactly the seriousness it deserves. This follows in the footsteps of the late series seriousness of Friendship is Magic that I talked about, where they started experimenting in different family makeups. Scootaloo's Aunt Holiday and Auntie Lofty were confirmed to be lesbians by series writer Michael Vogel, and they seem like rad ants. And before that, Brian Holfeld managed to find a way to get Terramar's parents, Sky Beak and Ocean Flow, magically divorced, or at least separated in a way that somehow didn't come across as a very special episode. Even further, Quibblepants' main squeeze, Clear Sky, has an explicitly stated daughter from a previous relationship, and Common Ground's main conflict is Quibble dealing with the very real fear of not living up to the expectations set by her biological father. But that's all secondary to the story surrounding the first person you think of when parents come up. I've already discussed this in my episode ranking, but I was not at all aware when I started watching A Perfect Pair that this was the episode that finally addressed Applejack's parents. I assumed that it was a lurking question during the first six years of the fandom, but during my first watch I just assumed they were dead and that we'd never get an explanation to what happened to them. And the craziest thing is, The Perfect Pair doesn't even provide an answer to that question, and I still enjoy the hell out of this really endearing snapshot of the moment their parents fell in love. My wife lost her mom at a formative age, so I've heard it a lot that when you have a parent that passes away, it's these kinds of goofy throwaway memories that you hang on to when they're gone. No surprise to anyone, but I think the show did a really admirable job in capturing that kind of relationship. Just so this episode doesn't end on a downer, here's a list of characters that I couldn't fit into the script, but deserve recognition for being really solid parents. Coriander Cumin was never worried about getting that hoof rating and spice up your life. He just wanted to make food with his daughter. Zipper Will's father Nightjar snagged the hottest acapella pony group to sing in his daughter's quinceanera, and even though Rarity's landlord tried to rent gouge her out of her shop in Manhattan unless she promoed his daughter Plaid Stripe's awful fashion ideas, it was at least a sign that he gave a damn about his daughter's interests. We also get little surprise cameo visits from people like Spitfire's mom Stormy Flare, Trixie's possible father Jackpot if you go by that Jim Miller tweet, and this kid working on their derby car with Derpy in the background of the cart before the ponies. Why haven't I heard more people talking about this? Derpy would be a great mom. If a family of raccoons can obtain gainful employment at a clothing store, I know she'd do just fine. Last year I got COVID a week before Christmas, and I spent basically two weeks trapped in my house. My family met up afterwards for a half-assed Christmas dinner at a local sports bar. As soon as we sit down, Mom greets me with, Sorry you missed Christmas, but we got you something, and hands me an unwrapped box of $2 My Little Pony band-aids that she'd clearly purchased at the dollar store on the way here. It was meant to be a light-hearted gag gift, but to date it's the only piece of MLP merch my parents ever bought me, and it's the proudest box of band-aids I own. Thanks a lot for watching. Parents are an interesting topic because everyone's personal experience with their parents varies wildly depending on who you ask. How do your parents feel about you being into MLP? If you could steal one character's parents to have as your own, who would you go for? I wish Alphabiddle was my dad, he's so cool. Until next time, I'm some horse on the internet. Thanks for watching.